Uh, welcome. This is the last uh, message of our uh, uh, summer read series, Vanishing Grace, the book. Trust that you have enjoyed it. Today, wanting to talk about faith and culture and where and how will they, those two be expressed. Matthew chapter 9, there's a verse of Scripture, and I'm just going to read it for you, and then I'll return to it at the end of our time here together. I just, there was some, a phrase in here that I was reading over this week, and it kind of caught me as it regards, or I think how it speaks to our expression of our faith in the culture to which we live. Matthew chapter 9, well, Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house. Matthew was a tax collector. No one liked a tax collector, both then and today. Um, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Or why is he a friend of sinners? We'll come back to that question at the end here. But I pray that you have enjoyed this book, looking at the notion of grace and how grace appears to be vanishing um, uh, within the cultural framework of our society today. And even if you've disagreed with some of the assertions, you can't read a book and agree with everything. At least we've made you think and ponder and question. And for us here at Gateway, that's part of our journey for you. Uh, don't think because we tell you, but believe because you are convicted. We want you to, to wrestle. We want you to stretch. We want you to grow. We want you to come to a deeper sense of the convictions of your faith because that is the only way you're going to be able to take a stand in our culture uh, with the faith that God has called you to. However, we all can agree as we have looked at this book. I, I think it could hardly be argued that that our world has a distorted view of grace or that the world is missing out on grace as we know it or perhaps as we have embraced it or understand it within scriptures. And I, I trust that it has caused you to wrestle and to argue and to ask yourself why. Why is the good news not so good anymore? I mean, God forgive us when we respond to people or respond to this question with some kind of a, a, a snub to the world. You know, the world is all evil and arrogant and indifferent. Well, if that's the stand that they're going to take, well, then you know what? Uh, too bad for them. But, but we must pause and consider the possibility that we are even partially responsible for this struggle. If the good news isn't good, then when did it lose its goodness? Or at the very least, where have you and I failed to demonstrate or to live out the goodness of our culture in such a way that our lives are attractional the way Christ was attractional? That somehow, as I have said in, throughout this series, that we would be the, the fragrance or the aroma of Christ. When did we start to stink? <laughs> And do you be continually gripped with the notion that all of history belongs to our Heavenly Father? All of it is an expression of God's love and mercy and of, yes, grace. That every person we encounter, the people that you are encountering right now here in this room, but those in your neighborhood and your community, those that you are going to reach every day this week, the people that you are going to rub shoulders with, every person, think about it, was wanted and desired by God. Every person planned by God, destined by God, a message from God for them, that all of creation is God's expression of grace and mercy and love. And therefore, His grace is best expressed in the good news, the good news that God loves me, that God loves you, and He does so immensely, that God immensely loves us. And that perhaps somewhere in the distortion of grace is that we have, in some ways, we have we have conveyed that the message is that God is mad at us. God's mad at you. Or that God wants to punish you. And that's not the message at all of the gospel. God's not mad. God's not trying to punish. But rather, he wants to show you a freedom and abundance that you can have through a personal relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. You can be free from that which entangles you and keeps you from all of God's best for your life. And that sin and all that is wrong in this world, all that is destroying both hope and peace and true love, 
that all sinful or wrong behavior is just man's desperate attempt to make things right in his own life, to find what is missing and to replace it with something. That's all that sin really is, is man trying to save himself, man trying to take that which is wrong and make it right under his own misguided venture. And the church, the church as the church, we are his representatives. You and I are both called and compelled and commissioned to go and to let people know by both our words and our actions and our lifestyle that God's got a better way, that God has a better plan. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is called good news. That's grace. Sadly, though, when it is presented to our culture today, it's increasingly second-guessed. Well, what's the point? What's the agenda it's rejected. Our, our motives are questioned. What do you really want? What, what are you up to? That our way is no longer considered a way at all, let alone the way. And we've talked a lot about the culture of our day, its perception of the church, and how if we are the representation of Jesus Christ and his message to this world, that we best do a good job. And I think that's part of the essence of what this book is really all about, that if we are the dispensers of grace to a lost and dying world, we better do a good job of it. Can someone agree with me there? And we need to personally and corporately ask ourselves a few questions today that it really is all I want to do as I sum up our discussion. Questions, first of all, about our reputation. What is your reputation? What is mine? What is the church's rep reputation today? Have we built enough bridges of trust? Are we a safe place? The people that you work with, that you rub shoulders with every day, is your reputation one of which that you are a safe place, a safe haven that they can go to? That Can people come to you and they know there'll be no judgment, no resentment, no anger, no put-downs? Are you safe? Do we have the right attitude? Have we created enough right outcomes that the persona of Gateway, the persona of this church, is that we are a good place to go because here it's safe or haven't we? When people in our lives need grace, do they know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I can go to you for grace because I know I'm going to get grace. Not only do we have to talk about our reputation, but I think it also speaks about our reference. The way in which we look at our world and what's our point of reference or our, our, how are we going to develop our worldview as we navigate the post-Christian era? Can we ask a world that is increasingly more hostile, can we ask them to accept or to live by the teachings of Holy Scripture? Or rather, are we called to not ask them to get onto our page, but rather we're called to live out the word of God incarnationally, much as Jesus did. That our lives tell our story, and in our telling our story, the story is boldly declared and demonstrated to a lost, albeit indifferent, world and culture. At the end of the day, the message is simply this. The greatest evidence that we are God's children redeemed by him and recipients of his eternal life is our love for others, our involvement in and con contribution to this community. That's how they will know. So we talk about our reputation. We look at what is going to be our reference. But also, we must talk about our responsibility today. Who are we responsible to? For what are we responsible for are we to toe the party line, even though we don't even know, seem to know, or agree together as big church even understands what the party line is anymore? Are we called to maintain orthodoxy without compromise? Is that what we are called to do? Are we to be a standard for righteousness in a world that seems to have gone mad? Or are we a church, are we called to, to make converts? Is that really what we're after? Is that what we are called to do? Cookie cutter Christians who clean up real nice and will kind of uh, uh, fit into our mold of religious piety. Is that what we're called to do? Or is there something more? Is there something beyond that that we are called to do and to be? In the story of the Good Samaritan, at the end of the day, the question is asked, who is my neighbor? Perhaps the real question we need to be asking is not who is my neighbor. Perhaps the real question of the story is am I being one? Am I really being a neighbor? And so to answer that question today, let us talk about our involvement in our neighborhood. How involved are we? Where should we be involved? Are we wanting to be a counterculture 
environment? Are we trying to change culture? Are we to flow with culture? Yancey asks this question at the, at the last section of the book. How should Christians engage in a democracy or in a culture that includes both a diversity of beliefs that is growing increasingly post-Christian? That's the question we want to look at today. And I, there was a book written a number of years ago by Richard Neighbor, who a famous book entitled Christ and Culture. If you're a reader, then you'll want to read this. If you're not a reader, then you know what? Get the Coles notes on it. But in this book, Christ and Culture, he describes some of the ways that the church and you and I as Christians might relate to culture and how we will express ourselves. And, and he has five ways. Let me just kind of walk you through them. He, he said, first of all, are we to be Christ against the culture? Is that what we are called to do? He saw this as a radical reaction in which all loyalty is given to Christ. All claims of loyalty to culture is to be completely rejected. That everything is worldly, everything is wrong, everything is evil, and we're actually, we should be living as classical Mennonites. Destroy your televisions, burn your radios, reject all manner of fashion. Uh, God calls Christians to come out from among them and be separate and to live in communities of, of pure holiness. Is that what we're to be? Should that be our response today? I hope not. I, I was raised in that. I, for those of you who can remember some of those inklings, how many want to go back there again? Okay. How about Christ with culture? Where the absolute conflict of one against the other has given way to a harmony between the two of them. Where, where there has been a complete relax of any form of standard, that all forms of social good is the best way to be an example of Christ. And so the social gospel, at all costs, at all compromise, where the best way to engage the loss is to go with the flow, with no message, no redemption, no repentance necessary, but we will win them by our love, that we'll just be so attractional that we don't have to worry about anything. They'll just want to naturally be with Christ. How about Christ above culture? Christ above culture is kind of more of a historical perspective, but times of old when the church wielded all power. We'd have to go back a couple hundred years when, when historically the Catholic Church or the Church of England, where all of government and all of society bowed in acquiesce to the, to the church, where the church was the authority, the church dictated rule and law and form, and everything was, was kind of in a bowing to the church because the church was ultimate in authority. And while we would say that it's been hundreds of years since we've had that expression, maybe not so long ago, because some would argue that that is the problem that's happening in the United States right now. The, the church is wanting the government to bow to him and, and that some of the battles within the United States today are, are really just battles of Christ above the culture and them wanting them, uh, 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 the government to bow to the church. Which gives way to Christ, the transformer of culture. Is that what we're to be? And that might sound pretty good. I mean, society is to, convert, uh, to be converted to Christianity. Why can't we just Christianize culture? If we're that powerful, if we're, we are, we, if we're that magnanimous with the message that somehow we will transform all of the world and make Canada once again a Christian nation. Is that what we're to do? Christian business, Christian arts, Christian music, Christian professions, Christian family day, Christian education, Christian government. Nothing is out of the purview of Christ's dominion over all. We are to transform the culture to become like Christ. Let's Christianize Canada. That's daunting, isn't it? I just, I'm exhausted saying that, let alone thinking that we're going to do that. And really, is that what we're called to do? Are we called to Christianize? It sounds like sanitize or sterilize. I would argue for Christ and culture to be in paradox to have tension. Culture may be seen as godless and sick, but nevertheless, we belong to culture. We seek not to escape it, nor to conform to it. I don't like everything about my culture, but I like my culture. I don't want to go to another culture. I like this culture. Some of the fashions come and go that I could do without, but for the most part, I like my culture. I like the world in which I'm living in to this day. I don't long to go back, nor do I look to go forward. I like the culture that I'm in because I'm called to serve my culture. 
This is where I'm placed. And when I go to other cultures for a visit, I can go to other cultures for a couple of weeks and it's great and wonderful and, and it's fascinating. But at the end of the day, how many like to come home? I like my culture. I even like the microcosm of my culture. I could love, I love the Muskokas, but I don't want to live in the Muskokas year round. Because it's only warm for a little while and then it's either freezing cold in the winter or black flies in the spring. So, I mean, I like London. God has ordained worldly institutions and we must work within those institutions as best we can. We tread a path that sometimes seems crooked and unclear, but we, but we try to honor what is divinely ordained by God within culture, such as family bonds and the rule of law, submission to legitimate authorities, while at the same time living out distinct values of the kingdom of God that is birthed in us as we best live without compromise. The Bible, our map, the spirit is our compass, and we are pilgrims on this journey. Journey. And we don't always get it right. We fail. You fail. I failed. The church has failed. Let's quit trying to pretend that we haven't, nor we, that we won't do it again. We will continue to fail. Just look at yourself in the mirror. We're not always going to get it right. And yet somehow, in the midst of all of it, God is working in mysterious ways behind the scenes. The conviction that God is always up to something in spite of our failures, in spite of when we've gotten it wrong. 2,000 years later, the church is still here. And we accept that we're never going to be free of suspicion. They're always going to suspect us. We will always struggle and we will always have to wrestle with the issues of what is compromise and what is compassionate. But never lacking in the hope and the assuredness that God is always working out his good pleasure through all of the means, both worldly and churchly. And that our call is to see and to cooperate with all that God is doing in this world. That we are, can bring shalom. I talked a year ago about, in a message about how we are called to bring shalom. That Jewish expression of peace. All the while recognizing that we will rarely succeed in, in truly bringing it lastingly until Jesus Christ returns. This is our wrestle. This is the wrestle of faith and culture. And in our everyday lives, we need to see our need, yes, to obey God, to live lives that are holy and pure, to be patient, to trust the Lord, to have his character developing within us, to see with eyes of faith all that God is doing, all that he is pointing us to. Yes, all of those things. But if we are going to have a faith in the culture of our today, if it requires any one thing, our faith is going to require courage. Say that word with me, courage. The measurement of our faith is being weighed and measured against our courage for how we treat others. How do we respond to others who are not like us, who are against us, who are suspicious of us, who question us, and yes, even will hate us? Faith requires courage to step out and act on what we believe and to do what Jesus did, even though that might feel awkward or uncomfortable. And is that okay? Is that okay? Because needing encourage implies what? It implies that we're in a danger or a risk or in jeopardy, that there's some sort of threat, the possibility or the potential for lost or cost. Courage is something that seems to be reserved these days for soldiers and police officers and firefighters, and I, I wholly agree with all of that. But what about you? What about me? How courageous is your faith? What about my everyday Christian life? I can't answer that for you. Only you can answer for you. But hear me clearly, folks. I can say one thing. That without a faith that is courageous, we're going to lose the neighborhood. You hearing me? If we as a church, if we as believers... If our faith does not become courageous, don't worry about your neighbor. We're going to lose the neighborhood. We're going to lose it all together. Faith and culture only stand a chance if we step out with courage. And so we ask the question, what kind of a life am I living? Is it characterized more by safety or by danger? By courage or cowardice? 
And again, don't worry about anyone else. This is a personal question today. If the kind of life that I live as a follower of Jesus Christ, if it is not one that is potentially dangerous to me, if it is not one that involves risk or one that requires courage in order to live out, is it possible that if I have invented a version of Christianity that is of my own creation? And is it possible that I have invented a version of Christianity that is counter to the version of Christ himself? If my life does not require courage, then maybe I value safety and comfort and my own convenience more than I value doing what Jesus calls me to do, to be salt and light and to be moved with compassion to help the sick and the hurt and the wounded of this world. It is a call to courage because it will result in a life that is characterized many times by discomfort, inconvenience, risk, and yes, danger. I'm constantly reminded that grace is free, but it is not without its cost. Do we dare pursue a life like that? Do we dare to do whatever God calls us to do regardless? Do we dare to be dispensers of grace even in the face of rejection? Big questions, for sure. But we either ask them and answer them now, or someday God will ask them of us and we will answer to him. I mean, truthful, I have to be honest, sometimes I care more about what someone thinks of me than I care about what God thinks of me. I don't always get it right. And sometimes I care more about my own comfort than I do serving others. Sometimes I'm more concerned about making a point than I am about making a difference. And sometimes I care more about my respected reputation than I do about another person's salvation. Can anybody relate with me here? Am I all alone in this or like... Come back to that verse of Scripture that I read at the start. Jesus did not tell us to love sinners. They say that Jesus was a friend of sinners, but you know, Jesus never described himself that way. Jesus never said, I am a friend of sinners. His motto wasn't eating and drinking with prostitutes, happy face emoji. <laughs> like, that, that, like that was not what Jesus is, was all about. The label of being a friend of sinners, that was a label that was used by the religious community. It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees that said that. And they called him a friend of sinners with a disapproving look. What's amazing about what Jesus did is that when he hung out with sinners, he didn't act like they were sinners. They were just his friends. Simple. People with names and faces and dreams and hopes and feelings. They were people like you and me, made by a creator, destined by his plans and not defined by their sins. Some of them hurt and wounded, many of them absolutely messed up. Yes, poor choices, yes, by sin, marginalized by evil's intentions over them, but at the end of the day, Jesus just called them his friends. It was the Pharisees who looked at them and invisibly scrawled sinner on their foreheads. It was the accusers who drew circles in the sand with themselves on the inside and those sinners on the outside. The words, a friend of sinners, were spoken with an upturned nose and a self-righteous sneer. Jesus didn't tell us to love sinners. He told us to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't tell us to love sinners. He told us to love people. And he doesn't call us to weigh or to measure or assess or, or to cherry pick the worthy or the unworthiness of anyone. So let's wrap this up. How does the world know that we are followers of Christ? They will know we are his disciples by our dispensing of grace. Christians who don't love much don't recognize how much that Jesus has loved them. For he who has been forgiven little loves little. Forgiven much loves much. It's a dangerous thing to mistake in believing that we're not that bad. What do you think Jesus sees when he looks at you? What would he say is your reputation? What worldview would he have you to take? Do you have the courage to change it? When you look at others, do you see sinners or do you just see people? 
Today, there are Christians who are trying to exert political power or influence in order to provide some kind of moral guidance or influence in our world. And this is part of this whole discussion within culture. And it's, it contributes to this anti-this, anti-that reputation that the church has had. And it just continues to grow more and more within the, the culture to which we are called to live. And, and, and any times that something threatens our beliefs, something that threatens our way of life, how do we respond? With fear and anger and judgment. And then we self righteous get on Facebook and we tell everybody what we think. I'll tell you. And then we find other dimwits who are better at writing and take their dimwitted comments and we copy and paste them in and say, I'll show you. And we continue to pervade and, and to spread this stuff all out there while the rest of the world goes, really? 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 If that's your Jesus, I think I'll pass. No, thanks. Why don't you just take your Jesus and run along? Because if that's, if that's life in abundance, I'll take what I can create myself better. Thank you very much. Could there be another way? When were we ever called to Christianize the country? God's plan of grace is as effective as it reaches one person, one family, one neighborhood, and one community at a time to be dispensers of grace and to leave the guilt for another day. Our strongest influence is to live out the life of Christ in a counterculture expression, not of superiority, but one of pilgrimage. A journey together to that celestial city that we call heaven and one day we're going to call home. And until then, our calling is to love and to, sp to speak peace and to dispense grace to be his fragrance. And the clashes between Christ and culture, yeah, they're going, he's going to be unavoidable. Light and dark and good and evil, I get it. But we can't respond with fear and anger and self-righteousness. We must respond with courage. We need to be wise to the days ahead and to choose our stand carefully and to fight our battles shrewdly. Christ has never asked that the message of grace come at the expense of righteousness. However, righteousness must be its fruit. Jesus influencing our culture in a way that does not stomp out the message of love and grace. How will we respond then? Do we completely withdraw from the political or the controversial arenas altogether? Do we just kind of pull back and say nothing? Will we engage in the process and choose which injustice to fight? And when to, de to back away on? Or are we going to try and, and force our beliefs and ram our values down the throat of those who do not believe or accept anyways and in order to change the world for Christ? Is that what we're called to do? Or should we try to seek form of alliances and bridges with other religious groups and in mutual concern so that we can somehow bring about a change? Are we able to distinguish between what is illegal and immoral and try not to impose moral code on non-Christians? Should we align ourselves cautiously with the culture in order to remain effective in challenging what is surrounding the culture? These are the big questions of the day. They will remain with us for years to come. So we best give them our attention before the whole world dismisses us and we lose the neighborhood. Amen? Let me remind you of something and then Pastor Wayne's going to let you ask some questions here. Jesus never tried to change Rome. He didn't try to transform Rome or conform Rome. And even though Rome rejected him and his message, 1,500 to 200 years, 150 to 200 years after Paul, Rome destroyed itself. But the church, guess what? 2,000 years later, we're still here. Amen? We're still here. Pastor Wayne, any questions, comments? He's going to run around with the mic. Yes, one over here. You talked about uh, ha having conversations with people and not expressing judgment and not saying where the right and wrong is. Can you maybe talk about some practical ways that we can do that without, you know, people come up and say all the time, what's right and what's wrong according to your religion? And then they will fight you on it. Sure, absolutely. What are some ways out of that? Okay, one of the first things is ask yourself this. Am Am I encountering somebody who just wants a fight? All right? And 
Whether or not I think they want to fight or, or not want to fight, how do I stay out of a fight? Jesus always asked more questions. I think the number one thing you can always do is when somebody's coming to bully you or wanting to confront you or corner you. And that's what they did. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, unfortunately it was for us it's the world and for Jesus' day it was the church. They always tried to corner Jesus. What did Jesus always do? He responded with another question. Another question, another question, another question. And after a while, they would begin to answer their own questions. And that's why they would get so angry and frustrated, they'd walk away furious. And all Jesus did was just ask more questions. So I think one of the ways in which we can respond when there is, a, when there is tension or when there is, when there is an agitation or friction is that in a loving way, in a caring way, we just continue to ask more questions so that we seek to understand more than getting them to understand us. And I think that's a healthy thing to do. Anyone else? Questions? We must have thoroughly exhausted the topic because there's not a lot of questions. Pastor Rick, you have done such an awesome job. There are no questions to be asked. Come on. Come on, can't somebody make him squirm? Oh, Come on. Somebody's pointing. Yes. Right up here, way up the front. Yes, Carrie. Um, there's a lot of issues, as there always have been, but today in our culture, they are really out there because of the world changing and things becoming mm -hmm. more okay mm -hmm. in the world with issues of all sorts of things. Yep. Not going to bring them to light, but yeah. the question for, I think, a lot of people for me is, how do you love and show Jesus? Um, sometimes it's easy, mm -hmm. but without supporting what their thing is that is truly, completely against what God teaches us is okay. Absolutely. Great question. That should be the question you ask every morning. I think the answer, first of all, is that that's a question you pray through every morning before you start your day. Because God help us if we're not encountering that every day. If you're not encountering that every single day, I question where you're at. I do. I question your walk with God if, you're not, if that's not in your face every single day. Because maybe you're not being enough salt and light. Maybe you're not contagious enough or courageous enough. That is the question that you should be wrestling with more and more every day. How do I continue to love and care and accept without compromising on issues and appear so that I somehow agree with everything? Because that's really the idea today is that, that if I disagree with you, I'm being intolerant. And, and to be intolerant is actually to be kind of, it's kind of now the new hate word to this day is that you're intolerant of me, therefore, you know, you reject all of me. And that, it, it's certainly going to be a wrestle. And I, I don't have five steps for you to answer that question, Carrie, but I, I, think the, I think the answer comes in starting every day off and saying, Lord, as I encounter this today, help me do so in ways that quietly, quietly, and with all gentleness and peace, the scripture says, reflect your character and your love and your goodness. Because, I mean, the scriptures are right. What fellowship does light have with? Darkness. Okay, so rather than you just trying to be the light that pierces into the darkness, just let your light shine, and it naturally pushes back the darkness and reveals. And so the reality is this. The more we respond in a loving, caring Christ-like manner, uh, and, and as much as in silence as we possibly can, I think people come around to themselves. See, I think, I think that, that when it comes to sin and unrighteousness, I think people are more self-aware than they, than they want to let on. They're just in denial. They, don't, they want to talk about it. They're, this is not right, so we cover it up with all kinds of layers. And what a Christian wants to do is, I want to fix you. So I want to rip it all off and, da -da 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 and expose it all to you. See how bad you are? No, 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 no. Just let it happen naturally in relationship. And over a period of time, I think they come into it themselves and go, you know what? I'm not happy with this. Can you help me with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think, it, again, I think it's a question of, as I said, the Bible is our map, but the Spirit is our compass. Okay? The, the map tells you how, where, what roads to walk on, but a compass just keeps you moving north. And I think sometimes we're better off to just keep moving north. 
The map is for us to walk in. The compass is something that we can use for others. Any other question? Oh, we got one there, one there. It seems like uh, you're asking us to evangelize and, and call in the people from the neighborhood and be a, a, a more of an evangelistic church. <laughs> and um, so as a church, we, I think we, you're talking about uh, us having fear because we're in a safety and we're trying to raise our children mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, to not be, uh, to be sensitive to sin. Sure. So, so now we're afraid of bringing, you know, these unsaved people into the church and they're, how they're going to affect our children and, and, and you know, the people yep. that they, they would um, affect. So maybe I'm thinking, you know, if we bring them to God, it's, it's the Holy Spirit's job to cleanse them. And because the Bible says that all men has, have a, a conscience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so the conscience, like you said, is like they're being convicted of their sins, but they're covering it up with layers. So maybe as a church, if we intercede and we ask the Holy Spirit and really bring forth the Holy Spirit and ask him to clean them, then we can, you know, maybe rest and have more faith that God is in control. Sure, sure. Uh, let me touch a little bit when you talk about, about the children. A lot of times we're, we're, so we're so afraid of how... The, the world is going to make our children bad or that somehow if we expose them to the world too much that, that you know, we're going to lose our kids. You know what? Cheryl and I determined that we would raise our kids to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, to be salt and light in their neighborhood and their communities. We told our kids that as long as they were loving God, they could have as many unsaved friends as they want as long as they kept that perspective. We taught our kids just to continue to love God. And you know what? They grew up. They knew what was right. They knew what was wrong. We were never afraid of sex ed or evolution or the boogeyman or anything else that the government was going to propose. And we never had to worry about that because my kids would come home and they'd go, yeah, the teacher was teaching us today. And I said, well, what'd you think about that? Oh, the teacher's wrong. Just wrong. That's not the Bible says. Like they just, they already knew. I don't think we, Christians aren't called to live in fear. If you teach your children right, you don't have to worry about somebody teaching them wrong because the truth sets us, make sense? So you're absolutely right. Question. Last one. Somebody's yeah, sorry. It's, it's not a question, just a quick sure. comment, just that to, to help me kind of wrap this up. Mm-hmm. I am responsible. We are responsible for our own opinions, our own actions, our own decisions. We're not responsible to change other people. We're not responsible for how other people behave or the choices of other people. And we are responsible simply to love. We're not Mm -hmm. called to judge. We're just called to love and to show, show grace. And so if we see someone living a lifestyle that we don't believe is a godly lifestyle or is contrary to what the Bible believes, we're not called to call them out on it. We're just to love them. Yeah. yeah, especially when it comes to the church versus those that are outside or those that are... Now, there's a, it's a different thing for those of us who are believers because the Bible says in Proverbs 27, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And so there's an accountability and a responsibility that we have to care for one another as we move towards that celestial city and pilgrimage, if you would, towards maturity, where we are accountable to one another. Am I your brother's keeper? Yes, you are. And so there is a responsibility that we have as Christians to help one another from that entanglement, from that burden, to move on and to become everything that God has called them to be. But there's a difference between helping somebody who's tripping up, who's entangled and falling apart, and pointing a finger and accusing somebody that they're not matching up to your standards. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that make sense? We all done, Pastor Wayne? Pastor Wayne, why don't you come close? And then we'll eat. I trust you've enjoyed this series. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> next month of August, we're going to be looking at life on the edge, and we're going to look at five characters in the Bible, five different Sundays, 
on individuals who lived courageous lives, lived on the edge of grace. We're going to have fun. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's one other side to this conversation of vanishing grace. And as we talk about our responsibility to dispense grace, the one thing that, that I'm always reminded of is that we need grace ourselves. And so I just want to encourage you, if you're in this room and maybe you've never asked God, maybe you've never reached out to experience the grace and the love and the mercy that God offers to each one of us, let me tell you, you can't take the gospel message to somebody else until the grace and love of God is inside of you first. And so if that's you, I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to invite you to, uh, to after this, just find somebody you trust, somebody you know that, that you're in relationship with, and talk to them about, about what, what this prayer means for you. Let's just pray, but as we do, why don't you stand with me, and we'll, uh, and we'll just close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. God, I thank you that long before we got here today, you were waiting to meet with us and to show us this love and grace that, uh, that you have made available to us. Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for the people in this room. And that just like Pastor Rick said, every single person we come in contact with is the kind of person that you value and you care for and you want to reach out to. And so God, I pray that if there's anybody in this room that does not know the grace and love and mercy that comes from trusting you, then I pray, Father, that today would be the day. I pray that something in their heart would, would be stirred and that they would be drawn towards you. And that, God, as we, as those of us who've made that decision and who've, who've prayed that prayer, as we begin to share this with those around us, as we begin to rub shoulders with other people, I pray, God, that your love and grace and mercy would so ooze out of us, God, that it would be so evident that we are not judgmental, that we are not condemning, but instead we showed love and compassion. God, I pray that we don't look at people as sinners, but we look at people as those whom you died on the cross for. God, I pray that you would give each person in this room courage in the next moment when they come into a scenario where they're kind of uncomfortable and they feel like they should be sharing something and, and everything inside of them says, but I don't want to. I pray, Father, that your spirit would bring courage in that moment, that you would give us the words to speak life into the hearts and lives of those we come in contact with. Give us the courage to care not about what this world and the people around us think, but only about what you think, God. We thank you and we praise you. I pray that you would empower each and every one of us. Be with us as we celebrate this meal. God, I pray that you would bless this food to our bodies and help us to have great fellowship around your table. Be with us, and for those who have to go, be with us as we go. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. Have a, have a great week.